for the time that we have to answer these questions. May you guide everybody here who's going to be answering. May your spirit touch hearts and encourage, strengthen people on their walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we've got about nine questions, so we're going to start right away on the panel. Again, these are the questions that you asked, and we are taking the time to answer them tonight, uh, all four of us. Some of us, if, uh, you know, as we answer these questions, uh, anybody here on the panel is uh, going to chime in if they have anything more to add. That's how we're going to do it, but a few of us have had time to start answering these questions and study through it a little bit. So the first question is, in the New Testament, Jesus did a lot of miracles, but he told many of them not to tell anyone. He also told the disciples not to tell anyone he is Christ. Why all the secrecy? Didn't Jesus want people to know, to know and believe? So I believe the passage is referring to Mark 1. So first of all, I'm encouraged that you're in the Bible and you're reading through the Bible. But let's read Mark 1 for a few verses. And it starts in verse 41. And we're going to hear here about this account where Jesus wasn't interested in people going to spread his name. And why all the secrecy, as the question is asked. So Mark 1 verse 41, and a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him, and sent him away at once, and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. But, was out in a des but it was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Okay? So the person who was told not to spread the news, spread the news in this account. Uh, so he disobeyed Jesus. And... Uh, why did he, why was this such a big deal? Well, if you read back a little bit, Jesus says in Mark 1, verse 38, check that out, and he said to them, let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. So context is very important when you're reading through the Bible, and in the context here, Jesus has a particular mission in mind, and his mission is to preach the word, to preach the gospel about the kingdom of God. And the attention to miracles would hinder this message from going out. Now that's contrary to what some of us have heard, that miracles might bring better blessing on the message uh, as you preach it. But Jesus says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't spread this message because that's going to hinder the gospel message. Uh, don't spread the message about the miracles because it's not all about the miracles, it's all about the message. Um, so the answer to the question shows up in the passage. Jesus' point of going to these towns is to preach the word. And because this guy went and spread it out that this Jesus is some miracle worker, he no longer could stick around in those towns because there was a, many people flocking to him. So he had to go about elsewhere in the desolate places. So it drew attention to the miracles instead of the message of Jesus. Um, so... He's not simply a miracle worker. Jesus is not primarily, primarily a miracle worker, but the Savior of the world, who performed miracles. Yes, indeed, that is true. But he performed miracles because he had pity on people. He came to save sinners from their sin. Okay? Second question. Vain or not, where are we supposed to draw the line? Makeup, expensive clothes, care about our looks, etc.? Lois. Hello. Uh, thanks for letting me be here tonight. Great to see all of you. Uh, so a couple points about that. I think, first of all, from the Word of God, it's the heart that matters, that really matters. Um, when you look at uh, the story of God choosing a king for his people, uh, his earthly people, the Israelites, way back, like 1,500 years ago, um, this is what David said to the prophet. He, uh, this is what God said to the prophet um, who was going to seek that person out, he said, do not look on his appearance or at his physical stature because I've refused him, a different person, 
For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So that was when he was choosing King David. Uh, it also says about women, uh, charm is deceitful, beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So first of all, ultimately God cares about the uh, inward person, the heart. However, he's not opposed to beauty because in the same story with David, when he chose David, he said, um, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And so uh, the Bible comments on that. And actually frequently the Bible will comment on people being good looking. Uh, he also said about Sarah, one of the, uh, the wife of the patriarch Abraham, that she was a woman of beautiful countenance. She was very beautiful. And of Rebecca, another one of the wives of the patriarchs, that she was very beautiful to behold. So the Bible, while it stresses the inward, it is not at all opposed to outward beauty. Um, so I think the thing for us is that um, the outward is often, often reflects what's going on inwardly, okay? Um, so the bottom line, is that I think biblically we are supposed to focus on developing an inside a pure and clean heart, which God uh, highly values and an attractive spirit. And uh, then be mindful of what your outward appearance is telling people because you all get that, right? Like we know, we look at people and we see different kinds of looks that people wear, you know, the punk, the emo, the hipster, the preppy, the gangster scene, goth nerd. By the way, I got some help with those names from other people on staff, because back when I was in high school and young adult age, we used different terms. Anyway, I think nerd always existed. But um, but the, uh, the point is that you know that how you dress says something about you. And so I would just say, I think what the Bible teaches, in a short answer, is give your most attention to your heart and your spirit, and then go and look your best appropriately in accord with that. So, Thank any you other Lord. thoughts from the rest of you? <laughs> well done. Thank you, Lois. What does it mean, number three, what does it mean to be set apart, and how far are we supposed to go? Check. Well, hello. I think that I have no faith in this microphone, so if it's cutting out awkwardly, just wave me down awkwardly as well. Okay, um, so I can't see this question well. So I think it's interesting because um, normally people ask holy, they're like, holy, what does holy mean? And we're like set apart. But this is like this reverse order, right? Like what does set apart mean? And typically that means to be holy. Um, what does it mean to be holy? Part of that is righteousness. Um, and I think there's a few different ways in, in which we're supposed to be righteous. So it's important firstly to understand kind of this idea, this concept of righteousness, I don't have enough hands. Um, I should have been designed with a third one. <laughs> Sorry, that calls God's sovereignty into question. Just kidding, two hands is enough. Um, it's perfectly designed, I'm totally fine with that, God. So I just wanna read this from Romans 12, because I think it's important here, and in here we actually see um, that God cares about righteousness and our righteousness in two areas, moral values and moral duties, okay? And I think this is what God means when he's talking about set apart. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so that's a moral duty. God's saying, whatever I command, whatever I told you to do, I'm asking you to do that. To not just be so excited about me that you're willing to die, but be so excited about me that you're willing to obey me no matter what to be a living sacrifice. So God wants righteousness and moral, our moral duties and how we go after that. Then he also says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, and that's talking about moral values. And it's just what Lobos was saying. God wants us to be transformed in how we actually live out our lives. He wants us to be living sacrifices, following the duties and commands that he's given us, but he also wants us to be transformed inwardly and to transform our moral values so that we're not being conformed to this world, we're actually being transformed. So the question is, what does set apart mean? How far do we need to go with that? The answer is all the way. You go all the way when it comes to being righteous in your moral values and duties. But I understand the context of where this question is coming from, and it really comes out of a passage in John 17 where we find what seems to be 
um, a paradox, this, this interesting idea where we're supposed to be in the world but of the world. How is that supposed to all work together? Jesus is praying, and he says, I am coming to you now. So he's talking to God. We get an insight into Jesus' prayer. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that you may have, so that they, speaking of Christians, they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That is underlined in my Bible and discouraging is the thought I get. Jesus asks that we stay in this world and that we're protected from the evil one, not that we're actually drawn out of how difficult this world is. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And then this is key. Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, and they too may be truly sanctified. Okay, that's a lot. But what Jesus is saying, he's balancing this thing where they're going to be in the world, but they're not supposed to be of the world. I'm not of the world, and neither are they. They're supposed to become more sanctified. Now, what's interesting about the book of John is different than the book of Matthew. There isn't this beautiful, great commission statement right at the end where Jesus sends his disciples into the world. But in the book of John, that was it. Jesus says, I'm sent, and so I'm sending them. So here's my point to you guys. The point is, how far do you go with being set apart? 100%. You are completely righteous in your moral values and duties. Jesus understands that you're in the world and that you need to be sanctified and become more like that, but never in a way that hinders us from actually going after the Great Commission, actually telling people about Jesus, actually having people be baptized in his name, and actually teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded them so they can be transformed. So that's the balance. How far do you go? You go all the way, but you never do it in such a way that actually removes you from the mission of God that God has given you. That's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Anybody else to add on that one? I just think, like, personally, as you're trying to find the balance, like, I think the two levels are one when you're trying to justify behavior that may be immoral, or the other extreme is when you're looking at others' behavior and, and there's a spirit of judgment. And you can kind of use those two kind of warning signs in your own heart as you're trying to wrestle through that and decide uh, how to live life. All right. Am I still on? You're off now. I'm off now? There we go. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, number four, keep it going here. By the way, if you do have any thoughts that come up while these are being answered, feel free to text away and we will try to answer those live. Uh, how does someone find everything, example, satisfaction, confidence, beauty, identity, joy, etc., in God? First of all, this is the most marvelous question of the night, I think, and uh, thus I'm going to take an opportunity to just go a little over the time. But um, I'm so glad that you asked this question, and uh, so I want to say a few things very briefly. Um, how do you find everything in God? Uh, I think that comes from a place where someone is just wanting to grow in their relationship with God and go all out. Um, so I'm very happy about that. First thing to consider, I, I'm thinking that I'm talking to Christians here, okay? Um, but I understand that not everybody is a Christian in the room, and that's fine, and you're welcome here, okay? But I'm talking now to Christians. So if you're a Christian and you want to find everything in God, here's some, some considerations for you. First of all, Romans 8.13, kill your sin. Kill your sin. Um, John Owen, a Puritan, said, uh, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Okay? Spiritually, you're not going to flourish and find everything in God if there is a sin that is your darling. You're petting it. You're cherishing it. You treasure it. You just can't wait to close the door and commit that sin. Okay? That sin needs to be killed. Okay? Why? Because that sin is hindering you for, from enjoying the satisfaction that God gives people. That God gives particularly to his people, his children. Okay? So kill your sin. One. Two. Delight or satisfy yourself in the word. Satisfy yourself in the word. Become deep thinkers about the things of God. Okay? Um, Psalm 18, 8 through 9. If you were at the devotions at the retreat, you would have heard this 
But the precepts of the Lord, this is what Psalm 18 says, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The word actually produces joy in you. As you've killed your sin, as you're seeking to find satisfaction in the word, your heart is going to be filled and enlarged with joy. Okay? Um, George Mueller said, and uh, this is a quote to consider as you wake up in the morning. This is what he said, okay? This is what he had learned in his Christian life about finding satisfaction in God. The first and great primary business to which I ought to attend every day was this, to have my soul happy in the Lord. To have your soul happy in the Lord. And that is your aim at Bible study. To get your soul rejoicing in the Lord. Okay? Um, Alright, so kill your sin. Satisfy yourself in the word. Delight or satisfy yourself in the Lord. That's the third thing. Delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37, verse 4. A great command to consider. Delight yourself in the word. word. Uh, delight yourself in the Lord. Um, here I'm thinking about uh, people deeply considering and thinking about God. Satisfying yourself in the Lord. Uh, making God the object of your affections. Making God the person that occupies your mind throughout the day. And that's why number two was number two, because you're going to have to get in the Word to get your thoughts onto that, onto the Lord. But He's the person you're caught up with. After you've got your soul happy in the Lord, you're just considering Jesus. You're just considering God more in your thoughts. Um, so He happies your heart as you're thinking of Him. Okay, I know it's not a word. I understand. But I like it. Um, so uh, consider, consider um, stretching your mind a little bit and thinking deeply about God. If you don't read a lot, I understand that's not where everybody's at. But, but you're going to want to start to learn how to read and to read deeply and to think hard about things. Um, the, I was reading a book on reading. Um, and it's a difficult pleasure. That's what reading is. It is going to take your concentration. But it is, it is, there is a lot of pleasure in reading, and especially reading about God, okay? Um, so consider reading about God in Christian books, in good Christian books. I have a few recommendations. Um, these are my favorites, okay? Some of you have already heard about my favorites before. Um, but first and foremost, Delighting in the Trinity is my favorite book, bar none by Michael Reeves, Delighting in the Trinity. It has changed my mind and changed my thinking about God completely. Second, The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer give you an idea of who God is. You s sit and read that book and your mind will be stretched, but your heart will be rejoicing in who God is. Um, other book, uh, J.I. Packer, Knowing God, and this, the last one that I would recommend is Rejoicing in Christ by Michael Reeves. Uh, so come at your reading and your thinking with the intent to want joy in Christ. You actually want something when you go to the Bible, okay? And it's not just to learn about things in geography and history. You actually want your heart to be enlarged and rejoicing, okay? Listen, you know Martin Luther, some of you uh, 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 know about Martin Luther. Listen to him as he talks about his study on uh, Solomon, okay? This is how he... He looked at studying the word. He was trying to preach through at a, a university the book of Ecclesiastes. How many of you have read Ecclesiastes? Okay, a difficult book, isn't it? Uh, I mean, what, what is that even about? Uh, so he was trying to teach that in a university, and this is what he said. Solomon, the preacher, is giving me a hard time, as though he begrudged anyone lecturing on him. But he must yield. <laughs> he will lose, basically. That's what Martin Luther saying. This is what um, study was, was to Luther. Taking the text the way Jacob took the angel of the Lord and saying, it must yield. I will hear about and know the word of God in this text for my soul. You will bless me. Remember when Jacob wrestled with the, with the angel of the Lord? You will bless me. Come to your Bible reading and say, God, open my heart. Give me joy. Bless me with more understanding of who you are. Okay? And lastly,
stay in step with God. Rush into the presence of God. Um, Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 16 says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Seek to be in the presence of God, where your sin is confessed. You're delighting yourself in the Lord. You're delighting yourself in the book of God. But you're in his presence communing with him. You're walking with him. You know that he's with you, and you're enjoying him. Okay? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. I said that was the last one. The last one, very simple. This is, you're, a, you're an embodied soul. Okay? So you're not just a Christian, like, you're all head, no heart, no, no hands, whatever. You're a body, too. So consider being satisfied in God also has some external um, aspects, meaning get sleep, eat healthy, um, and exercise, get some fresh air, okay? I know this sounds like I'm, a, <laughs> I'm not a medical doctor, that's obvious, but uh, just there's some things that in nature will help you and, and really are important, so eat well, sleep well, um, make sure your body is exercising and enjoying fresh air, okay? Satisfied? Oh, okay. Anything to add? I don't know how anything could be added, but I'm going to add something. Firstly, firstly, you know you love reading when you read books on reading, okay? Hashtag nerd, okay? <laughs> um, my only thought, my only, that's, Kenny's a nerd. I'm just pointing that out. Um, a book nerd. So all I'm going to say is it's easy for us to disjoint the good things in life from the goodness of God, and that would be a mistake to do that. God, not doesn't just do good things, he actually is goodness. In fact, moral goodness, is his, his character is the standard of moral goodness and all these things. So every good and perfect gift comes from him. And so when you take a nice deep breath and you enjoy it, when I had that thought this afternoon, I was like, that was good, praise God, right? Yeah, all good things, the breath, the comfortable clothes, the seats you're in, all those good things come from the Lord. And when we realize that he, beauty, truth, and goodness, and moral Everything good is just found in God, and it's a little bit of a philosophical idea, but it's what, what is affirmed in Scripture, that he is omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient, and he is morally perfect. So all those good things, we tend to think, oh, life can be pretty good without God. No, they're never good without God, because goodness comes from God. Um, and when you can take every single good thing that comes from you and realize that it's from God, then you're going to delight yourself in him quite a bit. Here. Maybe Nick, you're going to have something too. But uh, since you mentioned Luther, um, uh, I was thinking that uh, in finding your satisfaction in Christ, it is in Himself, but in all that He commands and gives us to do, as well as, as Matt said, every goodness. I was uh, reading a quote by Luther. Luther wrote in German. I was reading it actually in German, so I'll make a quick translation here approximately. He said, Everything I have, uh, all that's good you give me, and what you don't give me, I don't need. Uh, in you, you are my trunk, my attic, and my cellar. That's all, more than enough for me. So basically all his, all that he really needed, he saw came in Christ. And so, anyway, you my, my uh, trunk, my attic, my cellar. Like, uh, basically all that we need is in Christ. So. Thank you for adding. Uh, number five. What does taking up your cross really mean? Is it just putting your faith in Christ and repenting? Living day to day for him? Okay. So that uh, comes from Luke 9. Uh, I'll read it first. Then he said to them, If anyone desires come after, to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his day, cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a person if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? So uh, first of all, to notice a couple things about that, um, I think to understand what it means for us to take up our cross, we need to understand what it meant for Christ to take his cross, because I do think that that's the idea he wanted us to get. He was on his way to the cross. The cross was always in his mind and in his thinking as he was here on earth. That was why he came, and so... Um, there's, there's, uh, we can understand it by following him to his cross. First thing about Christ's cross is it was his own. No one else was expected to carry it. Uh, it was his own, and he uh, was the one to, to take it up. 
Um, and the second thing is it was hard for him. We know because we read um, before he was going to the cross, he had a time of uh, prayer in a garden, uh, hours through the night where he cried out to God, and um, it's repeated and recorded in a number of places, and several times he would fall on his face and pray, oh my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He was talking about taking up the cross and what that contained. And nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So it was a hard thing for him. It went against uh, a lot of what he would have desired. It wasn't going to be pleasant and positive, enjoyable. And yet, um, it was the last thing. So it was his own, it was hard for him, and it was to fulfill God's purpose. So he was, we were told in Acts, he was crucified by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So in that, I think we can find what it means for us to take our, up our cross. First of all, it's your own. You're not asked to take up Christ's cross, as sometimes people uh, quote or say. It is your own cross. Um, it will be hard at times, and it is to fulfill your pur God's purpose for your life. And I think therein is the key. God has a purpose for your life. And taking up the cross means to live out your life according to God's purpose for you, believing that God has a good purpose, that he's a good God, and his purpose is good. So there's the general purpose of God that applies to everybody, like don't lie, don't steal, don't commit sexual sin, honor your parents, love God, love others. And then there is the specific purpose of God for your life, which may be different than someone else. And so taking up the cross in your life may, for example, mean remaining pure while you're single, although someone else might be getting married. God's purpose for you might be singleness, and maintaining purity in that might be the cross. It may be being faithful and committed in a marriage, even when it's hard and it's not really what's enjoyable for you at the moment. It might be honesty at work where it would be easier to cheat or do the lazy thing and get out of something. Uh, it might be moving, meaning to move when you'd prefer to stay where you are because God is calling you to do something else for him. It might mean uh, serving. Uh, others serving in the community or serving in the church when you would actually prefer leisure time. It could be uh, telling your neighbor about Christ when you'd actually prefer not to have any controversy in the relationships around you. It might mean going to the mission field. It might be uh, for you caring for a handicapped relative. The cross that Christ is going to give you to carry is, uh, is for you. It might be hard, but the last thing is that um, there is a joy in it. Uh, we're told that Jesus, for the joy that was for, before him, despised the shame and endured the cross. So there's a tremendous joy because Christ knew there was a tremendous reward. And so back to our passage, uh, if we take up our cross, the reward for us is that rather than just losing our life, spending our days for this life and it's over, we are going to gain so much more than we could ever imagine. So anyone you've ever heard of who has lived out a life taking up the cross that Christ has given them to take has found incredible joy. Back to finding all your joy in Christ, some of it is uh, taking up your cross and following him in that way. Thank you very much, Lois. Anything to add on that panel, guests? Uh, only that... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't keep doing this. I'm trying not to do too much. Only that to the original readers, they would have understood this to be uh, to be an illustration for dying, obviously. Um, so symbolically, maybe literally, but that that kind of commitment to the Lord that you're actually willing to uh, give up certainly your your autonomy, if not your life. I had something on uh, a similar line, just that uh, I guess North American Christianity can often be. Uh, portrayed as easy or comfortable, and within this text and throughout the New Testament, we see that Christianity and walking our Christian faith out faithfully is going to be hard and hard at times. And, and just that recognition and that expectation as believers that there's going to be challenges that come, um, but also great joy as we, we live out our lives faithfully. Yeah, I love how you added joy in there, the, the joy set beforehand, because that's so true, so true. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, next one is number six. Number six. A doozy. <laughs> I believe that God created us male and female and that we are to play out the appropriate biblical roles of godly men and godly women respectively. In one of my practice at classes, we were talking about androgen insensitivity syndrome. 
in which an XY baby will develop externally as female and identify as female due to being insensitive to androgen. These people don't realize that they are actually male until usually adulthood. What would, the, what would be the biblical response in this situation for the individual and the community around them? Now, Nick is going to handle this one, but I just want you to know, I did not pick on Nick, okay? I know this is difficult, uh, but I, I didn't pick on it. It's just, I didn't pick on Nick. It's just how it happened. Take it away, Nick. That's what he tells you. Don't worry, I got this. This is not an easy question, but uh, thank you for whoever submitted it. And uh, it's just an opportunity to tackle a real-life uh, challenging question together tonight. So a little more information. Androgen insensitive, insensitivity syndrome, or AIS, is when a person is genetically male, right, XY chromosome, but is resistant to male hormones called androgens. As a result, they develop uh, as a woman uh, with some or all physical traits. And, uh, but they have the genetic makeup of a man, right? The XY chromosome, which is, which is key as we understand it in our time here tonight. Um, for reference, the number of people affected, just some quick stats, 0.005% of people, um, but it is a larger group when you consider, uh, there's a grouping of conditions called intersex or uh, medical term disorders of sex development and we're looking at one, uh, one in 2,000 people, or 0.05%, which one in 2,000 people is a, is a significant number to, to consider, and we wanna have a good biblical answer for it. Um, there is a distinction here from transgenderism, um, which is uh, psychological in, in, uh, as a basis, whereas this is biological, so there is a, there is a difference there um, as we talk about this. There is some interrelation though, because you can appreciate that uh, if you have a biological reason for uh, sex difference and, and sex confusion, that uh, uh, there's gonna be psychological elements in, in play as well and how the human body works, body and soul, body and, body and mind. Uh, medically, in this specific syndrome, there's a, there's a number uh, in, this, in this grouping, but this specific one, the XY chromosome can be tested at birth and then is apparent that uh, they are biologically, biologically male. So as Christians, how do we enter into this and, and respond to this in a, in a biblical framework? And that's what we're gonna try and do. Um, I'm by no means an expert, and uh, I'm trying to give a, a good answer tonight as we handle this sensitively and uh, with a biblical framework. Um, and we don't have the time as well. And I think it'd be important as, as you guys in your different fields of study to consider this question as well and want to give a Christian answer um, in medical and, and biology fields and uh, theology as well, how that all, all plays in. Um, whenever we talk about sex and gender and we're trying to provide a Christian framework, it's great to start from the beginning and look at Adam and Eve and look at Genesis and that, that helps us uh, get grounded so looking at Adam and Eve, and as, as the creation story follows out, we see that they're both created um, as humans, as equals in the image of God, but distinct as male and female. And we understand that physically, uh, biologically, they are male and female, um, but they're also distinct as we think of the immaterial, the, the spiritual dimension, the soul, the mind, how you can classify that, right? So there is not only a physical element, a biological element, but, but a spiritual one that we as Christians understand. So the same as we think of AIS, this, this person is biologically male, but developing as a female, but they're also spiritually male, and how they would, in that dimension, right, as, as they have a spiritual uh, soul that identifies as male, um, that God has, has created them as, as male. Um, to carry on before I lose all my stuff here. Uh, as we try and answer this, it, and we look at uh, intersex conditions, we understand that in, in creation there was order, and it was easy to see male and female in the distinctives. Um, since then, disorder and chaos from the fall it, it becomes 
very gray and muddy, and uh, we, we can see that in our, in our culture and society today, and when we're talking with this syndrome specifically. Um, so we want to help an individual, either a believer or not, come back to their um, role that God intended as, as a male in this case. We want to do this with love and sensitivity, uh, but with God's truth as well. Um, as we turn to Scripture, which is astounding to me, um, God is not completely silent on this issue, which, which is incredible. Um, in Matthew 19, Jesus is being asked about the legal grounds for divorce. Um, the Pharisees have brought him to this discussion, and, and why and when can they have a divorce? And Jesus explains that they were allowed to give a divorce certificate. I know it doesn't seem like it connects. I'm seeing fun looks at my, as I say this. It does connect. The passage continues. Um, there is a grounds for divorce. They were able to have a divorce certificate um, from the law of Moses because their hearts were hard. But then he continues, some don't follow this, the, the, uh, the purpose of marriage, as he's explaining, um, because there are eunuchs. And there's three categories of eunuchs, and then the first one applies to this AIS syndrome that we're, we're talking about tonight. And those that were born that way, right? Those who are unable to, to procreate. And we can see how this would uh, at least relate to some degree to what we're talking about medically, even though the language is, is not the same. Right? The, these, this group of people who are eunuchs that were born, born this way. Uh, we see God's heart. We're trying to give a biblical answer how we respond. We see a promise to the eunuchs in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 56, verses 4 to 5. God is giving a promise to two, two different groups of outcasts uh, in Israel. The, the foreigners and the eunuchs. And the challenge for the eunuch in, a, in a ancient Israel and in the Jewish culture is the high priority on having descendants, on having heirs, and eunuchs were unable to, to procreate. Uh, so they have that disadvantage, and to have children in that culture was seen as a blessing, and we still see that as a blessing today. Um, so the opposite would have been understood that that was a curse. If you're not able to have children, that was a curse in, in the Jewish culture. So unfortunately, this, this group is at a disadvantage and they're looked down upon uh, in the Jewish community. But in this promise, they're saying they're not going to be given children, but something greater, uh, a, a legacy, an enduring name that would last forever. And we see God responding directly to this group of people. And we see God's heart for, for these people. And... Uh, as we're trying to answer biblically here tonight, we see that, the, that God, as he has love for, for all of his creation and all his, uh, all his children, uh, we see this love represented in Isaiah as well. As we turn to the New Testament, we think of Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, as Philip is able to explain the book of Isaiah uh, to him, and he would have had two strikes against him as he's considering the message, right? He has the gospel laid out and um, what Christ has done for him, and he asks the question, for what reason can I not be baptized? He's thinking two levels. I'm a foreigner and I'm a eunuch. I, I shouldn't be accepted in this Jewish community. And, and Philip responds, there's no reason. And then, they, and then he got baptized. These, these people, uh, within the, if they have intersex conditions, if they have AIS, just like anyone else, uh, are able to, to come to God. Uh, God's grace is extended to them. There's no reason to think uh, that it's not. And uh, they're able to come into the community of God. And uh, as we think about, as, as Christians, if we have believers in our midst that, are, uh, that have this syndrome... Uh, we welcome them in, just as like any other member, any other child of God. And it is a reminder for us, which has been some of our questions tonight, that our identity is primarily found in Christ, and it's not um, in, our, in our sex or gender so much, as, especially as how society defines it and how we want to be a man, as, as the world tells us, or we want to be a woman, as the world tells us. Um, but first, we're, we're a child of God. And they will be a helpful for reminder, I would think, in, in our community uh, as they live out their identity and find full, 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 full fulfillment in, in Christ. 
there needs to be also great sensitivity as we think of this this culture that highly values being being a man if you're if you're male being uh, a woman if you're you're female hyper masculinity and hyper femininity the the struggle that would be there for someone with AIS um, you think of the challenges growing up and uh, being told that you're you're a male, but developing as a female, and the challenge that would would face. So be be there, be able to listen to stories, to to journey with them as they struggle through this, and be able to present God's truth all the time as well. So that's my attempt at the, at this, and I think we need uh, a way uh, longer and more thought out answer. But uh, it is a really good question, and thank you for whoever submitted it. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Thank you so much, uh, Nick. That was wonderful. Wonderful. I, I, like, those of you that are in the science field, I hope you felt ministered to to think biblically about this. Thank you so much for the hard work, Nick. I would just say that it's very, it goes back to what you said, Lois, about carrying your cross. This person is, is probably going to be carrying this cross, and it is a heavy load, and if there is a person... In our group, we would want to show that compassion that God has for these people, uh, just like Christ would care for, for them. So, uh, thank you, Nick. Anything else to add? Wonderful work. Uh, number seven. Sorry in advance for this question. Oh. You guys need to stand up, take a minute. Uh, feel free to stretch out if you need to. Uh, I mean, this was, this was submitted like three months ago, and it's just getting more confusing. Uh, how am I a Christian to view the results of the U.S. election? There is a discrepancy between the views of my friends and those of my family, which makes it difficult to address. I want to love my friends and discuss the topic openly. However, it is almost impossible given my pro profile as a Caucasian. I fear that what I say in regards to the election will become a threat to them in their minds since I am not of a marginalized group. If I were to try and share my views, it could be seen as tainted by my white privilege. However, that judgment in itself corners me, and by the definition of marginalized, makes me a marginalized individual. This reasoning may be misunderstood, but doesn't everyone have a right to share his or her voice? I didn't choose to be Caucasian or to be born in North America. All right. Well, that's quite a loaded question, and obviously we do not have time to get into this. We can start to figure out who it is. They were born here, yeah. and they're white. <laughs> I'm limiting some people. Who have seen any of this? Just yeah, kidding. yeah, Sorry. exactly. We won't help you. Yeah, no more anonymous questions. We're coming after you. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> just playing. It's a great question to be considering. Um, now, I just have guiding principles, because I'm not going to be able to get into the nitty-gritty. Nitty if you were here last year in Tough Questions, we talked about um, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, and we talked about how we are to live to glorify God and live in times where Christians may differ on issues. In that time, it was food sacrificed to idols. And I know that this is a political issue, but you do understand that within the church, we do have different perspectives. We do come from different backgrounds, and we do have different political views. So consider these general, broad, and I know you're not going to be satisfied with the answer fully, but I don't have time much tonight anyways. Guiding principles on how we are to act towards one another if we don't share the same perspective. The way we talk and interact and react in areas that we disagree with one another has potential to glorify God or discourage your brother and sister in Christ, or to dishonor one another. If you've been in political debates, you see that these th these things can turn a you know a dinner table into a war field. First um, Corinthians ten twenty four guiding principles. Okay, seek to glorify God and benefit others. Verse twenty four. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. So whether you eat or drink or talk politics, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Um, so, let me also say one more thing. Also understand that talking to my Caucasian brothers and sisters in the room, you do need to be sensitive and you do need to understand that you do not know what it's like to be marginalized. 
living in this country, being born in North America, you do not know what it's like to be called that person from a different ethnicity. Okay? You haven't experienced walking into room, a room and being only the, the only black person or the only Asian person in that room and being regarded, therefore, as the black guy or the black woman. Okay? So we need to be sensitive to these kind of issues and understand the talk from last week. Okay? There is diversity within the church, but we don't all share the same ethnicity, obviously. And we need to respect and honor one another. Okay? So this is mainly to my Caucasian friends to consider when you're talking about politics, there is another realm that you really don't understand. Being a minority, okay? Being marginalized. We don't understand that. But I will leave the rest if you talk, if you would like to talk with me uh, about this a little more, we can do that via email or tonight on uh, around snack time um, if you'd like to talk more about this. Now I'll open it to the panel to talk a little more about this if you'd like. This is obviously super loaded. What a conversation to have. Um, it's so emotional, isn't it? Um, and both sides are emotional, but I think that this is the best example of paradox that I've seen in our culture in the last little in the last little while. What I mean by that is that it's like um, there is there is discrimination and African American men. And it's like, and then so it's so confusing because it's like black lives do matter and all lives matter. But then what's happening is that these people are going like head to head. It's like somehow these two truth statements have been put against each other and are seeming opposites, which is that's exactly what a paradox is. But those two things are true, but that's produced because, and I'll say this, and I'm talking most, I'm talking now to straight white guys. We are the most privileged people in our, cult, in, our, in our culture. And the reality is I would just lovingly challenge you the way that my heart is convicted all the time to shut up and listen and to stop being afraid that power is going to be taken away from you because our culture is trying to even the balance and to have people who are more marginalized, maybe you're a little marginalized, who are more marginalized to be less marginalized. And when we, when we want to be like, black lives matter, oh, that freaks me out, all lives matter. Um, just let's take a moment and actually just step back. And, it, and when that happens, when I want to resist those types of things, and I want to say things like that, I, I think that the Lord convicts me to say about my own heart that it is my pride that is causing me to defend the current systems, not a compassionate heart towards those who are broken from being marginalized. And so is it true that all lives matter? Yeah, it, it is true. But that's not what the Black Lives Matter movement is about, is it? It's about a marginalized group of people that we need to listen to with love and compassion. It's hard, it takes a lot of humility. I can't do it without the help of the Lord, but it is the path that we should be moving towards. Excellent. And I guess uh, one other thought I would have, it says, doesn't everybody have the right to share? Well, in a sense, no, it's a right granted you. And so one possibility is just to say, do you want to know what I think? To listen and to say, do you want to know what I think? Because uh, that might sort of diffuse the image that you're going to push it on people. So, you know, if you want to share, if you ask, if they want to know. We'll get to questions if we have time. Sorry, buddy, we, we just don't have time right now. And that's absolutely right. Be, be quick to listen on, on, on these areas of, of uh, different perspective. Let's be quick to listen to one another and ask why and ask what and ask where, uh, as opposed to always just giving your view. So uh, number eight. And uh, oh, yeah, small group leaders, um, don't hate me, okay? Don't hate me. You're going to go over tonight, but uh, you're going to have a nice hot snack, so don't be sad, don't be sad or you know, be glad. Okay, uh, we got two more questions and then we might do some fielding, but we will probably be done at 8.45, okay? Is blasphemy really an unforgivable or eternal sin? I thought all sin would be forgotten and forgiven. 
Two things. Uh, firstly, blasphemy is, uh, sorry, I just it's really struggle not to read the question as I'm talking about it. Is blasphemy really an unforgivable sin? No, blasphemy is not an unforgivable sin. I know that's not what you're really asking, but that's the truth on that situation. Um, I thought all sin would be forgotten and forgiven. Secondly, no, well, people who aren't forgiven, people who don't actually cry out to God, are, their sin's not forgotten or forgiven. That's still not what you mean. Okay, so now what you actually mean. Um, after I've clarified some confusions. Uh, in Matthew chapter 12 here, it says, And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. That's the important part. You can blaspheme all kinds of things. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, that's blasphemy against the Son of Man, hashtag Jesus, that's his nickname, will be forgiven, forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, why is that? Why this distinction on blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? I'm not going to read too much for you. I don't have enough hands still. But uh, 1 Corinthians 2, I just want to read a few verses for you, 13 and 14. This is what we speak. Um, they're talking about the gospel, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept these things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Okay, it's all about the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, okay, or chapter, sorry, 2 rather. The point is this, when we're talking about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about what's going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where what has been revealed about salvation and about Jesus that is not human wisdom. That's something that is revealed to you by the Spirit of God. That's awesome. And so what's going on here is you can blaspheme against God, blaspheme against Jesus, but if you're going to have the Holy Spirit reveal to you that Jesus is the way of forgiveness and the only way to God, and then you are going to spit in the face of the Holy Spirit and say, I am rejecting that. And this is what was happening in this context. The Pharisees Though they were seeing miraculous acts done by, in the power of the Holy Spirit, they're saying, actually, it's being done by the power of Satan. We are rejecting the Holy Spirit. We're saying that is evil, that is Satan. And so the problem is, is that if you take the only way to understand salvation through Christ alone, and you slap it in the face and you reject it, once you've done that, there's no way to be forgiven because you've rejected the only way to be forgiven. So it's as though you're drowning in an ocean, and there's only one boat to save you, and you have rejected that boat, you are now going to die without being saved because you have rejected it. And so it's not, just as a point, I, I suspect that this question comes out of a tumultuous heart. You read a verse like that, and you're like, ah, I want to be forgiven. If you have that sense, you've probably not spat in the face of, of the Holy Spirit, right? Because you're still concerned about being tender to God and being forgiven. Those who are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit are understanding the message of Jesus Christ and are saying, I understand it. I am rejecting it. And for them, there's really, there's now no opportunity to be saved for them because they have rejected the Holy Spirit. That's all I have to say with that. Excellent. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Okay. Well, thank you for your patience. Now, uh, just on the minute, uh, Ben Howell, do we have any other questions that have come up? Two other questions. Are you able to flash those onto the PowerPoint and pull us off Facebook Live? Because we're going live. <laughs> Meaning we're not going live Facebook, but we're going live in here. Um, we're unliving. Uh,